Hey there. In this series, we're talking about some basic concepts of money and banking to help give you some background knowledge that's gonna help you understand the financial markets a bit better, the financial media, and just generally the way the world of money operates. In the previous video of this series, we discussed the concept of money and what its real purpose is. And I would definitely suggest starting with that video before moving on to this one, and the link you'll find in the description box below. It was out a little while ago, so you might want to watch it again just to refresh your memory, even if you did see it first time around. But anyway, in this video, we'll be taking our understanding a step further. I'll be talking about monetary systems. These are the foundations of everything that takes place, not only in the financial world, but also in the corporate world and even day-to-day -day life. I'll explain what a monetary system is and the main types of monetary systems. A monetary system is the set of mechanisms used by a government to issue money in a particular economy. The process involves the central bank, commercial banks, including the high street banks that we deal with every day for our own money, and the mint, which is a facility that actually manufactures the currency that we are using in day-to-day -day life. In any monetary system, there's a hierarchy of money. And to an extent, this hierarchy plays a role in how we define the monetary system being used, which is something that we'll come on to in just a moment. For now, take a look at this chart. We can see that there are two extremes. At the top, we have money, which we would refer to as the means of final settlement. And at the bottom, we have credit, which is a promise to pay money, or in other words, a means of delaying the final settlement. So this makes logical sense so far, and we, we all know what money is and what credit is, or at least we think we do, but what happens if we start to include financial instruments in there? At what point do we draw the line between what we call money and what we call credit? This hierarchy of money is something that we'll go into in a lot more detail in a separate video, as it's something that explains the reasons for a lot of the monetary policy decisions that take place in the central banks. But in essence, this basic thing that I just explained about where we draw the line between money and credit is a simple way to understand the different types of monetary system. Because in a very watered down way, which hey, is the best way to learn things initially, then the different types of monetary systems that we're going to go through are just different alternatives of choosing what is actually counted as money and what counts as credit. Now there are three main types of monetary system that have been used throughout the world. There's a commodity money system, a commodity backed money system, and a fiat money system. Ultimately, these systems should all be providing a unit of money that fulfills the functions of money that we discussed in the last video. A medium of exchange, a store of value, and a unit of account. So we'll start with the simplest system, which is the commodity money system. So a commodity money system is the easiest to understand because basically the value of the money literally comes from the commodity it's made from. And by the way, in case you don't know, in basic terms, a commodity is an item that has no qualitative difference. They're mutually substitutable. For example, if you swap an ounce of pure gold for an ounce of pure gold, they should be equivalent to each other. But remember, when it comes to money, they need to be a store of value as well. So something like gold is ideal as money, and it has actually been used as money in the past, as you're probably aware. It's also a good choice since there's a limited supply of it, although some countries can discover new gold, and they do discover new gold, which sort of takes the shine off things a bit. There are obvious flaws in a commodity money system, and I think you can even figure out some of the obvious ones without us needing to get into it in this video. However, those don't stop people from being very vocal, some people, being very vocal about the need to go back to a commodity-based system. In fact, you may have even heard of people buying large amounts of gold to protect their wealth since they don't believe our current monetary system is correct, which is something we'll come on to in just a moment. But first of all, let's move on to a commodity-backed system, which is different to a commodity money system. So if we go back to the hierarchy, in a commodity money system, it's very clear that the only form of money is the commodity in question, right? That's where the line's drawn. Anything below that will not count as money and will instead be credit. However, in a commodity backed system, the line moves slightly down because in this case, we have something called representative money, which can often be in the form of a banknote. But unlike the banknotes that we have today, these are directly linked to a commodity. 
In other words, your note gives you the right to exchange your piece of paper for the amount of gold that it represents. It actually represents something physical and that's very different to today. The most famous examples of this system were the gold standard system and the gold exchange standard system. Now these eventually led to what was called the Bretton Woods system and then the US eventually terminated the convertibility of US dollars into gold in 1971. And we have a video coming in the next couple of weeks that talks you through all of that history, the modern history of gold. And you can also see a link in the description box to a video about the petrodollar, which partially explains what happened when we had the Nixon shocks, which is when the US made the decision to stop converting to gold and to adopt a fiat system instead, which is a genius segue to our third system. Round of applause, please. A fiat system. It's the most complicated out of the three systems as the line between credit and money gets a little bit hazy at this point. Essentially, the same pieces of paper that could have been converted into gold in the previous system now have no intrinsic value. Whether this is a banknote or even coins, its only value comes from the fact that the government has declared it to be legal tender. It's not convertible to anything, so you can't get a nice chunk of gold as a conversion for it. It's not representative money. Now I like this one. Some people think of this system as a bit like a case of the emperor's new clothes. So you know that famous story, the emperor's new clothes, where the emperor gets conned into wearing an outfit, which he's told is gonna to be invisible to anyone who's unfit for their position or stupid. But in reality, he's actually just walking around naked, but no one dares to say anything to him, apart from a little child eventually, because they don't want to come across as being stupid. So this is like our fiat currency. Essentially, its value comes from the fact that we all accept it has value, even though in reality, it actually doesn't. Unsurprisingly, a lot of people complain about the current fiat money system, and even suggest that it's one of the reasons for a lot of the crises that we've seen in global economies. Since it isn't backed by anything physical, it means you can create a never-ending supply of it, which means that the value will be diluted, in other words, it's going to be devalued, to satisfy whatever needs there are from institutions and governments. Although that's a bit of a contentious topic, and it's one we'll talk about in a discussion video at some point, that way we can separate the sort of more academic or factual aspects of these lessons from me ranting and raving about sort of current events and that kind of thing. In the next video in this series, we'll start to look at the money supply and understand how money comes into circulation. This will also lead us on to understanding our slightly complex and unnerving system, which is called the fractional reserve system. And once you've figured out those points, you'll be well on your way to understanding a lot of the central bank announcements that take place and how that ultimately affects the economy. You'll also understand a lot of the issues that you read about in the funny pink pages of the financial press. But until then, if you have any questions or any comments, leave them below. If you found this video useful and informative, then please do give us a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe for more videos about financial and economic education, the markets, and of course, trading. Ciao for now.